Oh, there we go. Um, hi. Uh, I am uh, very excited to be here at FCOMF. Uh, <laughs> I uh, uh, thank you for the great intro. I was worried whenever someone intros me, I'm always worried they're going to give my talk. But one cool trick I do is I give an abstract, and then I talk about something else. So they can't do that. <laughs> So um, I am super stoked about the aesthetic of this uh, conference, this pixel art here, because um, I myself am a pixel artist. That's me surfing a Dorito. Um, my name is Jen Schiffer. That's my name. Uh, I, so being a pixel artist, um, if, you don't, if you're not familiar, pixel or 8-bit art is a style of art that embraces retro graphics, um, especially from old video games, which we've seen from uh, Addy slides, stuff like that. It's a style that works both on the screen and off. Um, here are some of my own, what I call, um, analog pixel art, or what I can show up here, because I do mostly erotic stuff, like most people. Um, <laughs> pixel art is abstract. Um, you don't need to be great, or good even, at drawing photo, like drawing photo realistically. Um, it's kind of like programming. <laughs> uh, with pixel art, it only takes a little bit of data, in this case about a thousand pixels in six colors, um, and it goes a long way in conveying like human emotion. Uh, and complex human emotions is the reason why people express art. It's why I make art, to express my feelings. Um, pixel art allowed me from a young age to express myself without feeling like I'm not good enough. That abstraction made me feel better. Some may disagree, but they're incorrect. Um, what I love about pixel art is that it lowers the barrier to artistic expression while at the same time invoking nostalgia in a fun and positive way. Um, these are all from people using makeapitart.com, which is my free in-browser pixel art editor that thousands of people use every day to express themselves freely and in an abstract and nostalgic way, uh, especially kids, which is really fun. When I'm not working on my pixel art, I'm working at my real job. Uh, I work at Fog Creek. It's a uh, small distributed company headquartered in New York City. Uh, it pioneered bug tracking with fog bugs about 16, 17 years ago. Uh, we co-created Stack Overflow, and we invented Trello. So you've probably used some of our products. Um, the mission for Fog Creek has always been to allow engineers to do their best work. So not only by building software like the previous mentioned pieces, um, but also by advocating for better um, employee practices and office practices like being anti-office plan, um, or most recently, we've updated our leave policy to include extreme weather leave um, in response to climate change. Um, one of our employees lives in Florida and had to leave for a week when the hurricanes came. And we, of course, were like, you can, you can take time off, that's fine, but it just makes more sense to have it in writing and official so that no employee of any level of privilege, privilege has to question whether they're allowed to do something. We hope other companies join us in that. And our newest product is Glitch, uh, or Glitch.com. Um, we describe Glitch as a friendly community where you'll build the app of your dreams. Uh, and our users are making things from static pages to show off cool CSS and JavaScript stuff. Uh, they're building full stack node powered applications, uh, prototypes, uh, even running production apps. And we've had a company called Lorem based out of New York that built their prototype on Glitch and raised a million dollars. It's weird, money, capitalism. I'll get into that later. Um, I even run my, my blog on it. So if you have production stuff, this is uh, powered by Ghost. I like calling it my Ghost blog. Uh, so glitch.com, besides being a community, is a collaborative in-browser editor that's free and allows you to build full stack apps in the browser without having to manage the deployment process. And we do that for free. So imagine you want to build something, and then you look at a blank screen, and you're like, well, not only do I have to write the code, but I have to figure out how to get this on the friggin' internet. How many people here have side projects that they've killed or haven't finished because it got to that process, and they had to move on to something, what some people would say is more useful of their time, like their jobs? 
Uh, it's technologically powerful using containerization in that you can remix existing projects to have your own deployed copy in seconds. And it's socially powerful in that we are community focused, specifically friendly community. Um, and a fun fact is that glitch.com, the site right here itself, is a glitch app. So if you scroll to the bottom, you can click that little view source button and see the full stack source. So finally, we're bringing view source to server-side files. It's powerful, it's very cute, much like myself and our stickers. Um, and if you are nice and say hi later, I might give you some. So Glitch is very similar to pixel art, which is probably why I ended up working on this product, um, in that it lowers the barrier to expression while invoking nostalgia in a fun and positive way. We have someone asking for help, someone who was just thanked for helping, and we got cute little hearts and confetti. It's really fun. Um, the difference, though, is that with Glitch, the medium is code and the tools are browsers and collaboration. Um, it's not my first go around in art and code. I used to build computers and paint them for my friends. One had a DVD player. Uh, <laughs> this is like 2003. Uh, building computers and designing their ginormous exoskeletons was my sort of first thing. And also this computer is my first one in college. Its name is Delanor Rigby. Um, I heard that y'all might be familiar with the Beatles. Um, so through college and building hardware and learning software, um, by studying and creating art and technology in tandem, I became a better engineer, um, as well as a better member of society, in my opinion. Um, I keep getting invited on stage to talk. Uh, which I think, honestly, is a redundant statement, being a better engineer and also a better person in society, because to be a good engineer to me means to be solving societal problems. Like that's why code has become pervasive, interdisciplinary. We are solving problems for humans. Software is for humans. Um, and I think that a lot of engineers have forgotten that, or worse, they actively choose to ignore it. But in allowing myself to think and work creatively um, and logically, my brains forced me to actively think about um, not just the good intersections of art and code like I've been talking about for the past few years, but also the unsavory parallels um, of my passions of art and tech, not just the fun ones again. And, and so today, because I'm tired of being known as the woman who hates blood parabiosis, uh, I want to tell you about those unsavory parallels because I feel like more of us building tech need to do the same. Um, and just so you know, about a month ago, I gave a talk at a conference in New York called Catskills Conf. It was out in the woods, it was pretty, nature. Um, and I did a talk about a similar topic um, called Jen Schiffer's Catskills Conf talk, or a few things that are bad about both technology and art, which I'm actively trying to fight or understand, but I need your help because let's face it, I'm 32 and would love to finally settle on literally anything, in essence, my career and or the ability to express myself effectively and ethically. That's my mission, by the way. <laughs> Everyone should have a mission. Um, so what I want to do today is a bit more polished, um, thanks to inspiration derived from a lot of really great conversations I've had in the past few weeks with people in all realms of technology, whether people who are avoiding tech because they're afraid of it, um, or developers like you who go to conferences to learn more. Um, I also have a better title, Abstract Art in a Time of Minification. Um, or a more refined discussion of a few things that are bad about both technology and art, which I'm actively trying to fight or understand. But I need your help because, let's face it, I am 32 and would love to finally settle on literally anything, in essence, my career and or the ability to express myself effectively and ethically. This is the most that I've ever worked on a keynote slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, Back in May, when uh, I was invited to come talk here, um, this is the abstract I gave, it's on the website. I said, aesthetic is a major component of any medium for art, it's true, including the web, true. But one thing that has been bothering me lately uh, is what happened to view source? Are we destroying aesthetic for the sake of tooling and in spite of access to our industry? Yes. Um, so view source is how I learned to build the web. Remy mentioned like GeoCities, MySpace. I learned to make the web by looking at the source of other existing websites and browsers and copying and pasting it into my GeoCities page, my Angel Fire page, 
adding CSS to like the bio text editor of MySpace to pimp one's MySpace page. Um, and it's not that easy to do anymore. We've hidden the view source functionality behind the label of developer tools, um, but what about people who are afraid to call themselves developers? What if people see developer and think that they're possibly gonna break the browser? Um, we also obfuscate our source through build processes like minification. So it's ultimately harder to view the source of a website and understand what code is going on. And there are source maps, but let's face it, who here like actually has set up source maps with every project that they've worked on? If you're saying you have, you're probably lying. Because I don't, and I'm me. Uh, <laughs> And I understand that like performance is something that we're really bad at, and that's why I really like the, the earlier block of talks, um, because we're really bad at performance, and that raises barriers to access, which has been mentioned before. Um, but we're raising the barriers to accessing the ability to learn to code at the same time, and I feel like we can all work together and stop sort of combating people's different missions. Because at the end of the day, we want the web to be a better place for everyone. We want the web to be open. Well, Verizon doesn't think so, but fuck them. Um, so yeah, this is something that we're actively trying to fix a glitch, and it's hard. A lot of compromise needs to be made between tech and humans. Right now, there's no accountability in tech, which is why our industry and society as a whole are quite in a dire state, in my opinion. Um, it's easy for us to map these problems to the art world, um, because we are mostly outside of it, but they also map to tech, and in like bad political climates, like after Trump was elected, everyone's like, oh, art's gonna be so good with like Trump as a president. I mean, they hate Trump, but they think that we're gonna express ourselves even harder with art. Tr art's gonna be so good. But like no one says, oh, we're gonna see some good tech. Um, because people probably know we're gonna fuck up, like we, we have been, and it's kind of embarrassing. So we should get better and have people have higher, higher expectations of us building things that allow them to have privacy and allow them to express themselves. And we have to do that by talking and learning from art. So one of the unsavory parallels that, of things that happen in art and tech is ephemerality. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that we make tools, the things that we make and the tools that we use for them can disappear at any time without our consent. Uh, in art, this is, it's a little dark, but this is the concert by Vermeer. It used to hang at the Isabella Gardner Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, my pal, Jessica Lord, who's an engineer, has uh, seen all of the Vermeer paintings, except this one, because in the early 90s, there was a huge art heist at the Gardner Museum, and this was taken out of its frame. So no one has seen it since. And there's only about 35 Vermeers out there, so it's pretty rare. There's a huge Vermeer craze, and you know, people are making fakes and stuff like that. But this piece of art here is gone. Um, this is me posing next to the frame. You can't really see the selfie of me inside the reflection of the frame. Um, Isabel Gardner said that she wanted the museum to stay the same always, even long after she had died. And so the frames where all the Rembrandts and the Vermeer were stolen are still there on the wall. It's kind of spooky and, and interesting to see. Um, this in part keeps the artwork alive, even in its actual absence. So can we do that with technology? Um, in this paper, the Afterlives of Network-Based Artworks, um, it was published this year in the journal of the Institute of Conservation. Um, art archivists discuss this exact topic, especially now that creating art using code is becoming more pervasive in the art industry. And I use pervasive because people aren't entirely stoked about the idea, but it's happening. Um, so Les Secrets, which is the artwork that they talk about, is, um, was a website where you were told, enter your deepest, darkest secrets, and people did. Um, and the conservatives in France realized that there was a database saving all of them, and one of them probably put in something gnarly, and so they had the hosting company shut down the project. Um, and they didn't back up the database when it was shut down. So the um, code for the website remains on a CD-ROM, but the database is lost. So this is literally all that remains and is shown when art shows display the artwork. And it's mostly shows that deal with conserv conservation that talk about it. Um, so if you've ever fucked up your routes, you're an artist. Congrats. But startups and even established companies and products fail all the time and they just disappear. And they're usually not that great at disappearing. 
Um, the shutdown of Vine, in my opinion, was a huge um, hit culturally. Uh, and even today, I wanted to put one of my vines in my slides um, to show that the content that I've been lost, but only three of my like 200 vines are on the website, all of them 404. Um, so with the decision of Twitter to shut down Vine, content from all over the world, all different cultures, probably the most diverse set of comedians I, and, and like comedy I've ever encountered is just gone. It might be in a hard drive somewhere, but Twitter's got other problems, I guess, to figure out. Um, last week, a long-running New York City news site called Gothamist and all of its sister sites around the world uh, was shut down um, just a couple of days after their um, employees voted to unionize. Um, and when you went to Gothamist or DNA Info or Shanghaiist or all these sites, you, instead of seeing an archive of the last 15 years of news articles, you saw a letter from the owner saying, like, I'm sad to say I'm shutting it down. Um, journalists scrambled all that night to find caches of all their articles. Their whole career, if they've only been working on Gothamist, was gone. Um, and my worries is that there was some engineer out there who thought it was okay to take the orders to make that happen. Um, and I feel like that puts them at the wrong side of journalism and labor and society. And we can talk about privilege, um, or you know, maybe they're fearing their job, but if you're in a situation where your job is shutting down and a rich white guy tells you you have to do this or you lose your job, and you don't think that you're gonna lose your job anyway, you're being extremely naive. Um, I viewed the source of the letter, and, this, and because there's weird code comments in it, and there was um, a class called Adios at the end of it, and I discovered that the person who did it just copied and pasted the code from a Stack Exchange answer. Um, and they kept that audios in, which was pretty insensitive. Um, and like, in the current political climate, at least in the United States, um, a rich man being able to shut down 15 years of news coverage because he's sad that his employees want to be treated like fairly is a very scary prospect. Um, right now, I think like, Time Warner and AT&T or something are trying to merge and the government is saying that they can't unless they drop CNN and it's being said that because Trump hates CNN, um, the government's blocking a sale from happening. So like media and journalism are highly at stake because of our administration. Um, and again, if you're, if you're an engineer or someone like that and you're going to naively think your career is safe, um, you just have to make a tough decision as to whether you're gonna say no and take a stand. We need more people taking a stand. Um, with, with Glitch, we, we talk about these issues a lot. Um, we take ephemerality seriously. Um, we don't make you prescribe to a certain way of programming. What you write there works anywhere else that runs node applications or static sites. Because um, if one day, if we were to shut down the product, if it isn't monetizable in this state of late stage capitalism, you shouldn't have to worry as a user whether you've lost your entire corpus of code. Um, you can trust because Fog Creek has been around for a while and has been successful, you can trust at that level that we will do you good, but you can't trust a lot of companies. You think that you can, I mean, there was a time where we could tr trust Twitter, um, but we as a company culturally believe that you shouldn't erase history and that includes URLs. I think that's sort of what W3C like sort of uh, pr promotes. And that is erasing history digitally and also in real life. Now if your rights are ephemeral but the product or art remains then you have an ownership problem and this happens in both art and tech of course. Um, this, is a screen, this is a graphic from shoparttheft.com um, Theft happens to independent artists all the time. Um, they make great art, larger retail companies all over the world steal them. Um, and this site collects evidence of theft and tells you where to get the real deal products. I feel like we should be more educated consumers and technology is being driven to make us less so. I think someone at the speaker dinner last night said that we're zombie consumers. We want to not have to talk to anybody. We want to order immediately. We want it to come immediately. 
and we want it to like work, but we don't think about who's making it, what their politics are. We're starting to see that now, like when we found out that Sticker Mule CEO is a Trump supporter, like a lot of companies and people decide to use other sticker companies. So even though you feel like you're not making an impact in capitalism, like the only way that we can combat that as like individuals and smaller groups is using our money. Um, and I feel like we have to do that. Um, because like in art, you're not gonna just blindly purchase a piece of art because someone claims it's a Vermeer. That actually happened, but that's a, another story. Um, and in tech, we see theft and even false claims of theft. Um, these are lawyers. Um, most of us are not lawyers. Um, I think we forget that sometimes. Uh, patent trolls are a huge problem in tech. Um, I've worked at a previous company that was being sued for using image maps, which is part of the HTML spec. And we knew that my company was basically like all these people there. And so the case goes to court, the company wins, but it costs money. If a patent troll goes to your small five person uh, consulting agency and you don't have a huge platform in the community, um, you're gonna go to court. Well, they're gonna ask you to settle, so you'll settle, but still you've lost a lot of money in settling because usually settling is cheaper than like going to court. Um, and this has been happening all the time. So something to think about and be more educated about. Um, ownership is something that we think a lot about at Glitch. Um, we allow you to export your code um, in a number of ways. Uh, you can export to GitHub because every Glitch project is a Git repo. Um, or you can just download a zip file because it turns out not everyone uses GitHub. Um, we're currently designing a way to manage licenses for projects, but it's a hard process because the nature of Glitch is you can use it if you're an experienced developer, but it should also be easy for new developers to get into and learn. And so it's a hard problem being like, here are a bunch of licenses and explaining what they are. Because I feel like most of us in this, in this room, we can say GPL, MIT, but like we don't know what any of those things actually mean or what our rights are. And so we have to be more educate ourselves as consumers of both free and open source software, proprietary software, and art. But ownership is hard if, and impossible um, to claim and prove when you don't have representation in your communities to back you up. That's why I mentioned before, if you're a small company that doesn't have a platform in, in the community, you're screwed when a patent troll comes to get you. you. If you tweet like, oh, I'm being sued for image maps, like the chances of someone seeing it are very slim. Um, gosh, I mean, where do I get started with representation in tech? Um, for Glitch, we're, we're a small team. Um, about, there's seven of us on the Glitch team, and Fog Creek has no more than 40 people. I think there's like 35 of us. And we actively think about representation in our hiring practices. Um, we always make sure that we keep interviewing people until we have a diverse group before we narrow it down to our hire. Um, and it takes a lot of work, but it's worth it. Um, Fog Creek has some of the best engineers and salespeople and marketing people in the world. Um, and we also think about it in our content creation, our social media outreach, and our product design. Um, fortunately, the bar is very low. I feel like not a lot of people are thinking about it. Um, and if more people can admit that we have a representation problem, I feel like it would be so much easier to fix than it is now. And the art world is extremely underwhelming when it, with regards to its representation even today. Um, with that adversity has come great collectives and organizations around getting representation for all types of marginalized people in art galleries, but it's an uphill battle even in 2017. Um, let's not ignore the fact that most of the items in museums in this country have been stolen from other cultures, um, and you know, the United States as well, but contemporary art itself um, doesn't have proper representation. I'll give you an example. Um, the Whitney Museum, which is in New York, um, has a biennial. Huge celebration, tons of artwork from kind of different people. They have a history of not being great with, with uh, representing black artists. Um, Emmett Till was lynched by uh, two white men in 1955 and over 60 years later in 2017. Um, a painting rep representing or, um, what was the word, portraying his open casket was hung in the museum um, and is painted by a white woman named Dana Schutz, a young one, young woman. Uh, this appropriation was protested. Um, this man appears Parker Bright. Um, he 
uh, I believe his shirt says Black Death Spectacle, and he stood in front of the painting. In response to all the outcries about appropriation of a white woman trying to tell the story that nobody really wanted to see in the Whitney Biennial and of a young black man um, being in an open casket, it's a morbid painting, um, she responded, art can be a space for empathy, um, which is what I feel like a lot of people of privilege, in essence white people, say when they've screwed up. Um, a space for empathy is exactly what Mark Zuckerberg said about virtual reality um, when he created this almost comical augmented reality experience. And I say almost comical because that backdrop was the real life post-hurricane carnage in Puerto Rico. Um, if you squint your eyes, you can probably see the space for empathy between their two hands about to meet in a high five. I'm just like, why, why are people sometimes? And not only does like appropriation happen in like art galleries uh, and online, but it also happens with startups and products. So these two former Googlers, they're always, they're always, whenever someone says former Googler, blah, 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 I'm always like, this is not going to end well. Um, <laughs> These are uh, the founders of a startup called Bodega. Um, there was an article that was announcing them as one to take down mom and pop shops, um, which today nobody like wants to hear that. They might want to do it, but no one like out loud says like, I want to take down the people from the community who are doing good for people around it. Um, but even if that was not their intent, um, they did appropriate um, a Hispanic word and idea of a community tied business run primarily by people of color. Um, and the, the outrage was warranted, but a lot of tech people in my Twitter responses about this were like, because they use a cat as like the logo, because bodegas typically have cats to keep the rats out. Um, more people are concerned about the cats. What happens to the cats if the bodega shut down? And I know that deep down they don't actually believe that, but this, it sort of doesn't help the, the growth of performative outrage around these things. In response to their outrage, they said, we did some homework speaking to New Yorkers, branding people, and even running some survey work asking about the name and any potential offense it might cause. But it's clear that we may not have been asking the right questions of the right people. Duh. Um, this is another thing that people of privilege, in essence white people, use when they mess up. And while we're busy appropriating cultures and solving problems that don't in the grander scheme of things exist, um, no one's like, gosh, I wish there were fewer bodegas. Um, we claim actual real problems like accessibility are too hard to solve and focus on. Um, why would I use a button element even though that's accessible? I prefer to use a div because it's unstyled and it's hard to style and I just want to avoid CSS. It's like, you will argue yourself a mile around the block a hundred times to avoid using the button element. Um, and if that's like what hill you want to die on, like I don't trust you to be a good member of society. Um, sometimes it seems like you have to either advocate for accessibility or web performance as if they don't go like in between a hand in hand. It does, it just takes some work. And I feel like lately, um, engineers these days are almost proud of avoiding work, which blows my mind because in the same breath we take to say accessibility is hard, we will talk about how important all the work that we are doing is. Um, my boss, CEO of Fog Creek, Neil, said that optimistic belief that every problem can be fixed sometimes leads people making tech to think they're the only ones who can fix things. And all of these problems are severely exacerbated by tech's persistent failings at inclusion, which means these problems affect marginalized communities even more acutely. So like we're making tech debt for people we think we can solve problems for instead of listening to them and what the problems they, they have are. That's why whenever there's a tragedy, you have a bunch of engineers that show up and they're like, I'm ready to make a CRUD app and like they don't need a CRUD app, they need our money. We're making so much money, give nonprofits money. He also said in that post that software that exacerbates racial biases in the criminal justice system is a big bug. And he mentions this because there are cities in the US already using algorithms for sentencing. So imagine, or look at real world, um, that, there, that there's a white supremacist society, us, 
designing algorithms to do their work for them. So a couple of weeks ago, this is Lamonte McIntyre. Um, he just got freed from prison after 23 years for a murder he didn't do, um, 23 years being the majority of his life. Um, because humans, there, are no, there was someone who might have been a witness, there was no actual evidence, it took 23 years for him to get out, and that was without computers. It was human error. And humans, who are flawed, are building algorithms to try to do their work for them. So obviously, it's not going great. Humans are making errors that ruin lives, and we're teaching computers to do the same. And there's this false notion that like, oh, well, computers do things better. They don't. I, even without having a master's in computer science, one of the earliest things I learned in college about computers, and maybe like people who are self-taught are missing this, computers don't do things better. They do things faster. And there are some problems that get solved better with speed. But sentencing people to prison is not a speed problem. It's an empathy problem. And every day we see new ads popping up for services using artificial intelligence when really they mean machine learning um, because we also like to appropriate disciplines that have already existed and treat them as new in order to convince VCs to give us more money and get more users. But we're forgetting that normal people don't like robots and artificial intelligence. Um, and they're afraid of it. They're afraid of their jobs being taken, as they should be. So I'm gonna go off the script for a second here and talk about artificial intelligence. So again, I have a master's in computer science. I was introduced to artificial intelligence on the academic side of things. We talk about artificial intelligence as if it's something that exists already. Um, Lori Voss gave a great talk at Dinosaur JS this year, and he was like, if there was AI, we'd be dead. So this is my theory about this, and I feel like it's just reality. Human beings, we face uh, what this man Jerry Valentine once called uh, the adversity cycle. You meet adversity, you get fear from meeting that adversity, and then you figure out some way to not freeze, but adapt to overcome that adversity, and then the cycle continues, especially if you're a marginalized person. And that's why I feel like people who are marginalized tend to be the stronger out of the group of people, because they've constantly had to go through that cycle. I myself was raised by racist parents. I recognized through adversity that that was wrong. I overcame it. I don't talk to them anymore. I've had endless conversations with them. But I learned how not to act through that situation. Computers can't do that. Computers only learn what we are feeding to it. It doesn't know how to recognize adversity, face fear from that, and overcome it and do that cycle. The moment that computers can do that, that's artificial intelligence. And they're gonna realize how much we as a society suck, and that's why Lori Voss means we're gonna be dead. So, in conclusion, capitalism. <laughs> so normal people are afraid we're gonna replace their jobs, and they should be. Um, we, and it's weird because like, we get more outrage about our childhood movies being rebooted than about the fact that many of us, many companies, even represented by people here, who are trying to make autonomous driving a thing, are actively trying to kill off the truck driving industry, which is the largest industry, at least in most of the United States. Um, and I don't know, it just like blows my mind that our, like, we think that we're so great, but our, our circuits are not really going off correctly because, it, I don't know, it's just bananas. And I could go on and on about why it's bananas. Um, but I feel like, we're like ignoring history, and like someone once said, like those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. Like we're constantly repeating it. Like we're not happy. A lot of us are miserable to, today because of the state of tech, because of politics, and it's not because it's not like not a new thing. Like this has been brewing for a while. Another way to learn from art is from paying more attention to the designer community in tech. We always say people in tech, and we think just developers, but designers are in tech, marketers are in tech, content marketers and creators are in tech. Um, Robin Kanner is a, a designer at Etsy, um, and she gave this great talk called Has Your Misery Ever Been a Sight to See? Uh, and she asked designers in the current landscape today a really powerful question, and that's, what's your legacy? Um, she said, you know, I'm gonna die someday, and it could be any time, and that sounds morbid, but that's true, and it's gonna happen to all of us here, like, what is your legacy going to be? We need to be held accountable for the tech that we're making, just like designers should be, so we need to ask ourselves, what, what is our legacy? 
look at the last 20 tweets that you've made. Are you arguing, arguing with somebody? Like, what if those are the last things that you see? Whenever I get on a plane, I'm like, gosh, if something happens, what's my last tweet? What's the one that all the news sources are gonna go to and post on like their blogs and stuff like that? Like, I think about that because I am very concerned about what my legacy is and what people think of me. And it's either going to be about my activism, my tech talks, or like my alien dick jokes. Like, you never know what it's going to be, so you have to actively think about that. Um, and you have to talk, because you have to think and talk in order to solve problems. Um, so think about ephemerality. You have to be aware of the platforms you use to create content. Have a plan ready in case you have to shut down a service. Um, some people say this is bad luck, but they also say that when a bird shits on you, it's bad luck, and that's a fake idea. No one wants to get shit on by a bird. Um, don't act naively in bad faith, faith or collude against your coworkers or your users, and just like ultimately be a good citizen. In terms of ownership, stop fucking stealing, be an educated consumer, learn about software licenses while keeping in mind that you're probably not a lawyer, um, and remember that proof of ownership requires a large amount of privilege. Um, accept your privilege, use it for good. Um, avoid appropriation by letting people tell their own stories, and ask them for, for what help they need instead of deciding what help they need or what stories need to be told. Um, people without access to the web is not an edge case, um, and that access should not be an afterthought. Um, stop only talking to your friends and your buddies. Widen your network, diversify it. Um, if you fuck up, it's your fault, so apologize. There are plenty of resources online that teach you how to apologize because none of us seem to know how to. Um, and most importantly, remember that new developers are following us on Twitter, on Facebook, they're seeing our conference talks, and they're learning how to socialize and be an engineer by seeing how we interact. They think we're cool for some reason, and they're following it. They're like our little siblings, whether you like it or not. And so, Let's stop creating monsters and start being actual role models ourselves. If this all resonates with you, I want you to use Glitch because I want our community to um, be a place for role models and people seeking role models and be a friendly space for developers of all levels. And if you want those kind of users to use your APIs to build great things, to solve real problems, we want to help you. Um, yeah, I've been talking about Earn Code for years now, and this is, this is my first conference talk ever at jQuery Portland in 2013, and the political climate has changed at the news surface, surface level, um, but all the issues that we face in tech today have been festering for a really long time. Um, and I've adapted my content and life's work to combat that, and I just ask more people to do the same, especially those with a lot more privilege than others. Um, so, I mean, like I always say, learn code, make art, you know, you can make art, learn code, make it, whatever, assess that work, adapt, and just most importantly, be ethical doing it. Bless.